So in three, two. And now, good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Curriculum Committee for June 22nd, 2023. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast throughout Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Lichter? Present. Ms. Pumphrey? Present. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Present. Ms. Dominowski? Here. And Ms. Hassan? Thank you. Thank you. Please call and note the names of all staff members participating in the meeting. Request if there are any uh, request if there are any other members participating on the call that you have not named. I have Dr. McComas. Present. Dr. Wistead. Present. Dr. Elmendorf. Present. Ms. Myers. Present. I have Dr. Kraft. Present. Ms. Brennan. Present. Ms. Bailey. Present. That's all I have for now. I don't see any anyone else. Thank you. Whoops. Oh, I'm sorry. I just clicked it off by sec by accident. Just give me one minute to get back. Okay. Um, committee chairs will facilitate discussion by calling off names of committee members to speak in turn. Committee members will also acknowledge they have a question by calling on the chair then saying their name. Staff members will answer any questions posed by committee members by saying their name first then speaking. This will allow for accurate recognition of those that speak out. Staff members that want to add any discussion may call on the chair to speak, then saying their name. If the chair calls for a motion, the committee members will move and say their name, and a second committee member will second and say their name. The chair will then state may have a roll call vote. Assistants will speak each committee member. Assistants will speak each committee member for their vote and record appropriately for the um, ETA. Okay. So we're ready to get started. So we're going to first review and approve the 2023-2024 committee dates. Um, so Dr. Gomez, do you want to um, say anything about that at this time? Yes, um, thank you for the opportunity. So um, in looking at um, the committee dates for next year, we took a few things into consideration. We recognize that a number of our uh, members on this committee, of course, are working during the day. So we we work to try to move the dates to the uh, an after like an afternoon early evening time uh, to accommodate work schedules. In doing so, however, we had to shift from the third Thursday because that's when the equity committee uh, is in session. Um, and so these dates reflect moving our committee meeting to the first Thursday of the month, um, and they fall. Um, you know, again, not where uh, possible, not on weeks that there is normal board meeting. Um, and so that's how these dates were determined. And then I wanted to also inquire as to what time would we like to start the committee? If we want to do 4, 4.30, um, we're flexible. So we just wanted to survey and hear what your preference was. Okay, so um, board members, what preferences do you have for time? Does anybody? Um, I know two o'clock is hard because it's kind of the middle of the afternoon. Do you want to say four o'clock? 430. Uh, Chair Lister, 430 works best. This is T.R. Booker Dwyer. Okay, thank you. Ms. Pumphrey, comment? Yes, I agree. I think okay. 430 works better for me. I can always adjust my time if needed, but because I work during the day, 430 is better. Yeah. Okay, and Ms. Demonowski is 430 good for you also? Yeah, that'll be great. Thank you. Okay, okay. there we go. OK, thank you. So if we uh, if we approve these dates, then I will move forward and work with Ms. Gover to get them scheduled to be virtual 430 to uh, 6. We typically do a 90 minute committee meeting unless there's something um, in particular that needs more time or needs to be in person. So the standard will be virtual 430 first Thursdays of the month. 
Okay, thank you. I don't think we need to vote on that or anything, right? Okay. okay. No, as long as everyone's agreeable, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. All right, the next item is the CCBC and CCR MOU. So, um, and for that, I think we have Dr. Wisted, Dr. Woolridge, and Ms. Brennan um, to give a short overview and then answer any questions we may have. Sure. Um, I will take the lead on that. I know that you listened to the recorded session. Um, just as a reminder for the Blueprint for Maryland's future, there are three pathways. The early college program dual enrollment program is one of the pathways that students who are deemed as CCR, college and career ready, would um, have. Ooh, go ahead, keep rolling. Thank you, Jim. Um, so what you may recall is that we actually opened up access for all of our students, whether they are deemed CCR or not. So um, if we go to the next slide. OK, here we are. We opened it up for everyone. Um, they can go any semester. It used to be restricted to fall and spring. Now they can do winter or summer as well. We're paying for the tuitions, the fees, the books for everyone. We're doing credit and non -bear credit bearing courses. Next slide. Um, and as a result, we've had a huge increase. Um, and so this is important for you to remember when you see this at the contracts committee in July. Um, I don't want people to have sticker shock. There is a, a much bigger increase um, because we have a lot more students attending, but we do get blueprint dollars to help support those um, fees and courses that the students are taking. And then next slide. Uh, this shows the demographics, so where you see the BCPS demographics and the students that are participating in the tuition free program from the fall. The, so you can see it's not quite a mirror image. Oh, go ahead. And then finally, you know, um, the, we had to update the memorandum of um, understanding. So we already had a contract with CCBC. What you'll be seeing um, in July is a five year extension to that contract, which was an option for five years ago when it was approved. And so we updated the MOU just to make those changes that I discussed, which was, you know, previously we used to only pay for up to four classes. The kids paid for their own books and fees. And so we've changed all that based on the requirements of the blueprint. And those are the updates to the MOU. And I'm here for questions. Any board members have questions about this MOU? I just have one one question. Go ahead, Mr. Manaski. Um, can you just give me an example of like a non credit bearing course as opposed to a credit bearing? Sure. Um, there may be courses that students are interested in, like um, like an art course or a you know something that would not be required for their dual credit uh, you know something that's a non-academic type course or it could be leading towards uh, credentialing instead of uh, leading towards a college credit um, so that might be some examples and that wouldn't affect the blueprint funding if it if it's not going towards like a a college credit course or advanced Correct. learning course. Good question. So if we go back to that slide that showed the three pathways, one of the requirements um, for the blueprint as well is to ensure career and technical education programs for credit or non-credit certificate or licensing programs. So all of those would um, suffice as far as the blueprint dollars were concerned. Okay, thank you. Good, good question. <laughs> Any other questions from board members? A question. Ms. Booker Dwyer. So, uh, so great presentation. You know, I'm all for this MOU and um, providing the opportunity for students to get uh, to, to go to CCBC and not have to um, incur the cost. So, my first question is in the MOU, does it define the support that students will receive? So, like, is there a college counselor? Um, on site at CCBC that provides that support to them 
or, um, you know, could you just talk a little bit about the support students see, um, receive when they are taking these courses at CCBC? Sure. Um, I can't recall if it's specifically listed in the MOU under the CCBC responsibilities or not, but it is the practice of CCBC that um, students have access to advising. Um, they also have access to their professors um, for like the office hours and all of that um, type of thing. So anything that a typical uh, student at CCBC would have access to is what our students have access to. I'll just also add that for some of our programs, like our early college access program at Woodlawn High School and our PTAC programs, we have on our side, on the BCPS team side, we have individuals who help I say mother hen, uh, those students and check on them and see how they're doing and, and kind of help them learn those um, executive function skills to keep up uh, with those programs. And those programs, as you know, are very intense and very um, structured as opposed to per, uh, perhaps a one off student who may be picking up some extra college courses. So just to uh, assure you that we also have team members on our side who are trying to um, shepherd our students to be successful in accessing those early college opportunities. I know I've had conversations um, over the last year about how do we expand that support on our side in our comprehensive settings um, and working with our school counselors around checking in, uh, having a check-in process with students that are taking these courses because of course it, it creates a multi-dimensional schedule for our students as opposed to, you know, a sort of a traditional schedule where they're just in the school building with us all the time. And Mary, to follow up on that um, as well, because uh, yeah, maybe I neglected to mention that, you know, students can go to the CCBC campus or we do on location courses at our high school. So to tie into some of the things Mary was say, saying about it, um, you know, we CCBC has also began recruiting specific staff that are going to go to our high schools. Um, and so there's an understanding when the staff gets hired that a part of your load, your caseload may be working at one of our high schools. So they're also working as a really good partner to find the right people to serve the high school student. And then my last question was just around the transportation, um, because I know that can be a barrier in and of itself. So. Um, in the MOU, is there anything about transportation or ensuring that if the court, if the classes are on the CCBC campus that, you know, a, a student can get there? No, there's nothing in the MOU about that. We have been working with our Office of Transportation um, and uh, many of our high schools with some outside of the box ideas, um, some things that have come up and that they're piloting at some of our schools is the fact that the school could have a bus um, and if they find a staff member who would get the, the, the CDL licensing, they could drive a group of students over if they could pay a contracted person to do that. They also have a pilot program and I'm going to say the wrong name of it, but there's like a specific name for a smaller bus that you don't need a special license for, but you do need training from the Office of Transportation. And they've piloted that at some of our high schools as a way that potentially a staff member, as uh, Dr. McComb has said, sometimes we send the staff member with the kids to the campus. Um, you know, they could drive in there, they could be there as a check-in point, and then, you know, they could come back. So it there's layers to it, right? Because you have to find the person. That person has to not have a, a courses that they're teaching during the time when they're driving kids, you know, but we've been brainstorming with the Office of Transportation some other ways um, students could access the campus rather than the on location at our high schools. That would be helpful. And I know in some other states what they have, you know, beyond just the normal public transportation, you know, putting them on a bus or, um, you know, giving them vouchers for that. Um, I know that specifically in New York, they started, um, they, they have been piloting kind of this Uber voucher um, for students. And so that's just something, and there's criteria that the people have to have, and they, you know, there's all kinds of safety measures in place, but that has been, um, beneficial, I know, in, in that state at getting students around to the different um, learning experiences. So that's just uh, something else to consider. Thank well, you. We'll take I that. Think, yes. 
Thank you for okay. that. I actually want to share that um, the one of our partners at CCBC already <laughs> reached out and said we have to have a meeting to discuss what the SUNY program does. And I wonder if that's one of the, the things in what he wants to talk about with us. So thank you for that. Go ahead. Mary. <laughs> I, yes, I'll just add that. Thanks, Melissa. I'll just add that I do know uh, Dr. Yarborough and transportation had been looking into the voucher process and we had discussed it about a year or so ago related to our evening extended day learning program um, because we in working through all the things that we've done to support transportation's improvement, um, we had to shift from transportation in the for the evening program at the end of the evening, and we were looking at uh, exploring uh, those kind of drive services to support students in that uh, piece. So I do know that their transportation has been doing some research, um, but uh, we certainly will follow up on that. So. Thanks, that's all my questions. Ms. Pumphrey, do you have any questions? No, I'm all good, thank you. Okay. Great, then do I have a motion to approve the CCBC and CCR MOU as presented? So moved, Humphrey. Thank you, do I have a second? Second, Dominowski. Thank you. Ms. Cox, can you do a roll call vote, please? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. OK, thank you. The thank next you. item on the agenda is third party billing. And we have Ms. Myers and Ms. Pierce ready to answer any questions and provide a very brief overview. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Ms. Pierce, if you want to join me on this on the screen, that would be great. Um, just for um, just kind of a brief overview, this is a billing system that we use for our um, Office of Third Party Billing um, to um, bill for Medicaid services to support our students receiving special education services. Um, so are there questions about it? We can get into it in further detail. This is a modification for an extension of we've used this vendor. Um, and as part of the contract, we had the opportunity to uh, modify for an extension, which is what we um, are going to be moving forward, asking to move forward with. OK, thank you. Questions from mm -hmm. board members? I have one question. Go ahead. How do we know that they are effective, that they are delivering services as intended? Um, could you just speak a little bit to the effectiveness of this uh, third party uh, billing system that you're using? But who, yeah. Yep, sure. So um, I'm going to actually ask Ms. Pierce to be able to answer that question. Sure, sure. Uh, so we've been using Civic Solutions for the past five years uh, for, and we've been averaging about $8 million annually, which is the most that we've received, as well as uh, the best interagency Medicaid monitoring team audit. We're audited every year by the state, and this is the first year we, where we've received a minimal uh, amount of findings due to the edits that they have in place, ensuring that we are billing uh, in compliance with federal and state regulations. And so when you say a minimal amount of findings, could you just speak a little bit to the findings? Um, and were these findings caused by this billing system or was it, you know, could it, in like the root causes of the findings? Sure. So for example, in order for us to bill medical assistance, we must bill in accordance with the student's IEP. So, and the student must be, uh, have parental consent as well as um, case managers, parent, parental consent and approval of case managers. And for the first time, we had 100% uh, of uh, billing with parental consent. We had no findings where services were billed not in accordance or not in alignment with the student's IEP. Um, so, yes. <laughs> Okay, now that's all my questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? Okay. 
Um, then can I have a motion to approve the third party billing contract as presented? So moved, Dominowski. Thank you. May I have a second, please? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. Ms. Cox, can we have a roll call vote? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Booker DeWire? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next agenda item is magnet program approval for the 2024-2025 school year. And we have Dr. Almendorf, Ms. Schubert, and Mr. Stoll available to answer any of our questions. Sorry to say you're stuck with just me today. Okay, so <laughs> just Mr. Dr. Almendorf. Yes. Um, yeah, so I want to highlight a few things. I heard you emphasize it, um, Ms. Lichter. This is these are changes that are being proposed for the 24-25 school year. So um, they would come out in our brochure this summer and in the fall so that parents could um, consider these uh, magnet programs as they would apply in the fall for the 24-25 school year. I would also want I also want to point out that this is a relatively new um, adventure here for the board in that this board policy was approved in just April of last year in 2022. So um, moving forward, any proposed change to magnet programs or schools um, would be part of um, the board's purview to approve. And um, the last thing I would say in overview before I take questions is that, um, as I mentioned in the first slide in the narrated version of this um, PowerPoint, all of these changes are either designed to increase access to magnet programs, maintain access, or uh, maintain or increase consistency. So the two examples of increasing access to magnet programs would be um, the Eastern Tech example of having that program on the east side of the town where it exists on the west side of town already, um, increasing access to the strings program at Deer Park Middle, and then increasing consistency at Carver with the name change that's more accurate, and then um, maintaining the magnet program that is currently a Golden Ring that would move to the new Northeast Middle School when Golden Ring Middle closes. Okay, thank you. Questions from board members? Uh, can, can I ask a question that's not directly related to the um, slide per se? And if, if it's not in line, you can, all, you can send me information later. Sure. Um, sure. My question is about the curriculum that's used for the BCT magnet. Um, if we um, connect with local carpentry unions at all regarding um, that curriculum. Um, that is a good question that I might need to come back to you with, although if um, Ms. Shea or someone from CTE is on this call, they may be able to answer that immediately. I'm not sure if they're on this call or not. Because that's a CTE um, or unless Mr. Stoll looks like he was able to get on. I don't know if he has the answer to that question if we partner with local carpentry. And I didn't mean to, I apologize, I didn't mean to, I just no, came okay. to mind when that's I watched your slides. So if you need to get back to me, I'm perfectly fine with that. Yeah, I, we will probably need to get back to you, but I will say that our CTE programs are very well networked with local resources, both for mentorship as part of our CTE advisory uh, council group. Um, and so the chances are, are pretty high, but I don't want to uh, and tell you an inaccurate thing. So we will confirm that for you. Uh, but our, our CTE programs are really top notch. Uh, we're very proud of them and uh, are generously connected to our community resources. So we'll we'll get back to you with okay. confirmation on that. Fantastic. Thank you. Absolutely. Other questions about the proposed changes? Ms. Right, Booker Dwyer. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, Ms. Dominowski. Did you? No, go ahead. I'm fine. Okay. Um, so I just have a couple of questions. So the first question, I love that it's um, you're expanding programs like at Deer Park and at um, Eastern Technical High School. How will that impact enrollment at these schools? Will it cause the enrollment to to go up in schools that are already overcrowded? Like, what could you just talk a little bit about the enrollment in those schools? Definitely. Yeah, that's a great question. So Eastern Tech specifically is actually um, under capacity and this would actually help them to be closer to their capacity. So it actually has kind of the opposite impact for them um, where they would be able to fill more seats at Eastern Tech than they currently do. They're they're traditionally um, under enrolled. 
Um, at Deer Park, the pr program already exists. It's just um, this would give access to more people. So this would give access to students who are actually not in this physical school itself, which is are the only students who can currently um, take part in the strings program at Deer Park. So this would um, open it up so that students from other schools could apply to that magnet program. And of course, the number of seats is very much controlled by, by the principal. So the principal wouldn't open more seats than they can um, make available um, in the in the coming year. Right, so we recognize that uh, Deer Park, you know, we've been working around the this the enrollment uh, capacity there. Right. Yes, um, very much over enrolled. Right. Um, and then so for the George Washington Carver Center program, mm -hmm. the building and construction technology, is this the same program that's at um, the, other schools that are offering construction programs, so like at Milford and some Correct. of the other schools. Yeah, it's currently in place at Eastern Tech, Milford Mill, and Sellers Point. And so then will the application process to get into that program change to align with um, with the other schools? Because I know that the, the bar is a bit higher um, when it comes to the assessment to get into Carver, and that kind of leaves some students out. Um, and so when you look at the, for instance, the Milford assessment compared to the George Washington uh, Carver Center assessments, they're drastically different for essentially the same program. Um, and so could, could you speak to that, like with the application to, to get into that program, is that going to be modified now since the programs are the same? So will assessments be the same across the board? Um, I don't think that carpentry is one of the um, magnet programs that has a centralized assessment. Um, we have a few that are um, like dance, for example, but um, there. And, and Mr. if Mr. Stoll is on this call, he's going to be able to answer this with more um, specificity, but the there's a difference between applying to the school and applying to the program. So um, while Carver may have its own um, assessment criteria, the assessment criteria for the construction program itself wouldn't differ significantly be between and among schools. It does. Um, we just went through this process and it's a significant difference in what's required at to get into the Milford construction program and what's required to get into the Carver program. Um, the assessments that are required for, for to not to enter the school, but just to enter those carpentry programs are significantly different. Um, and, and I almost feel like it puts students who are not um, students with who have. And I know this isn't the point of this conversation because um, this is all about just can, you know changing the program. Um, so so I don't even want to get down in the weeds, but that's just something I want to put on the radar. Like as you're thinking of as you know, if we approve these changes to the program, there needs to be consistency in how students are accepted and mm -hmm. um, and, and they can enter that program because right now it it. It appears that car, you know, it's only 20 seats in Carver, and then there's, you know, X number of seats at this school. And the way it was, the way I understand it is that, you know, you get the almost the cream of the crop kids, and then there's two kids kids that can get in through the lottery out of over 300 people that apply to the program. So there's some inherent inequities, um, I think, with getting into the Carver program um, c compared to some of the other ones. So if the if the program is changing to mirror what's available at the others. I just ask that the that you all just look into that application process to make sure that it's consistent throughout. Yeah, if I may. Um, so first of all, you're absolutely right, Ms. Dwyer or Booker Dwyer, is that um, we have to um, equalize those and centralize those admission programs. We have been slowly working through that process um, where the programs are offered at comprehensive um, magnet schools. Uh, we bring the faculty together uh, and engage them in that discussion because as you have pointed out, um, rightly so, the our magnet landscape has had grown up very um, organically and was differential. And we know that that is counter to our equity work. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that you're absolutely right um, and that we will definitely take that back to the team and and um, see where that is in that uh, the uh, schedule that we had been working through around those, pro e you know, equalizing those admissions programs. But these Absolutely. programs are great. I love them. They're they, and they are aligned to industry standards. They're they are wonderful, um, rigorous programs. So this, yeah. 
I think they're great job. All students should be able to get into them and and take them, I think. Right, right. No, absolutely. And we agree. We don't, I mean, our team has um, we're not done our work. I'll acknowledge that, um, but our team has been um, working to make sure that there is standardization, right? Because the the whole point is access to relevant, you know, high skill, in demand, high wage opportunities, right? So, so thank you, Ms. Dominowski. Did you have a question about this? Um, that more or less answered my question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and and also. I think when some of these presentations are made, it uncovers or gives questions. For example, what just happened right. leads to some leads to another question. So, um, and I think the one that Ms. Booker Dwyer brought up is is critical. So, is there a way that that can come back around? Um, you know, for during the next school year, as far as an update yep. on where we are. So, okay. So, and I want to encourage the board members that even though, because like what Ms. Pomfrey said before, like it wasn't exactly, I think that's okay if your questions aren't exactly aligned to the presentation, but the presentation may have sparked other questions that could, could and should be agenda items for the future. So don't hesitate to ask the questions. It just, we have to accept, we might not get the answer right now, but we'll bring it back. But I think the one, this idea about the um, different, and I guess experiencing it as a parent on from Ms. Booker Twyer's um, yeah. viewpoint gives you a whole different perspective. But you know that that is worrisome if we have different criteria for the same program at you know at different locations. Yep. We'll be happy to put it on the schedule. And I think in that um, we will make sure that we also talk through the entire application process and you'll get a sense of how that's different at the elementary level, the middle level, and then the high school is, of course, our most complex um, system. And we'll talk a little bit about the history and evolution of where we were, where we are, and where ultimately where we're, we're working to, to be. So thank you. We appreciate the opportunity. And then also, could topic. you add the North, what the the armory, the, I don't know what we're calling it, the plans for the Northwest? Yes, the Northwest. We're very excited about that opportunity. Um, yep, I will make sure that we add that to it as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm, my pleasure. Okay, any other questions about the, from the magnet program point of view? Okay, so do I... Do we need to approve this? Because this is not a contract. We okay. No, do I have no, but it does. It will be going on to the full board for the July uh, meeting, and so of course, if it has the committee support, okay. it facilitates that at the full board. Okay, no problem. Then can I have a motion to approve the proposed magnet program changes for the 2024-2025 school year? So moved, Booker DeWire. Um, thank you. May I have a second? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Lichter? Pre yes. Ms. Sorry. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Next, thank you for that thank you. part. Thank you, Dr. Almendorf. The next one is our special education strategic plan. And for that, we have Ms. Myers and Ms. Bailey. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. So um, I'm prepared to go through this. I also know that you saw a presentation about the strategic plan. So do my just for direction, just to go over briefly through each slide. I don't want to reiterate if there were. Um, if everyone already heard me talk about it in the slides as well. Um, um, by shaking your head, board members, would you like her to do an overview? Or OK, just do a, a okay, quick. Great. OK, <laughs> if I um, missed Myers, if just to, to launch that, um, yeah. if I just may, I'd like to share with our members today uh, just some of the largest context. So we as a school system have been in some form of, and I'll use the expression broadly, corrective action with MSDE around serving our students with IEPs for almost two decades now. Um, and so we have been, you know, we might make progress in one area and, and not in another, you know, so we um, set down this path, Ms. Myers, 
uh, has great vision and she and I discussed, you know, she brought forward, she's like, I really would like to engage um, with some external supports to develop a strategic plan to really help us as a whole community lift up our students who receive these services. So I just wanted to kind of allow you to sort of have this long term um, understanding that we as a system um, have dramatic need to really lift up our entire service model for students receiving um, IEP support. So I'll hand it over to you, Ms. Myers, at this point, because this is really um, a shining example of your your visionary leadership and your role. Hey, thanks for that. Hi, everyone. You're okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so I can get really excited and talk about this all day, which is why I wanted to provide the opportunity. <laughs> if you didn't want to hear it, that was also fine. <laughs> yeah, we would like to hear it. So um, yeah, so we can go to the next slide, please. So this is really what um, Dr. McComas has been talking about, and this is just kind of four target areas that we know historically have been challenges for us as a system. Special education um, has continued to be that area that is needing of great attention and support um, for a long period of time. So um, I was excited to have the opportunity coming in this um, school year. It's been my first year in this role to really um, kind of go down this this road of developing a strategic plan um, and want to highlight in collaboration with um, my my partner in crime here is um, Kanye Bailey as our director. So thank you so much for being here. So historic challenges, as Dr. McComas mentioned, we have continued this needs improvement status on state accountability measures. So, you know, we make growth in some areas and not in others, and then it kind of fluctuates. But just generally speaking, we've been really highlighted as needing to improve how we're doing things. Um, systemic achievement concerns are noted. Um, you see our data as far as our, our schools that are in targeted um, school improvement efforts and um, comprehensive as far as CSI. It just especially continues to be the area that we are not, it's clear with our student data that we're not meeting the needs of our um, of our students. Um, that disproportionate identification, placement, and suspension of our Black and African American students. So um, really needing to lean in um, in this area and look at our practices and how we can interrupt what's uh, what's happening for our kids. Um, and the fourth being there is that the call for increased transparency and information sharing with families. So what we've heard over and over is wanting more information um, for our families and wanting to be part of the process. Um, you hear um, it's evident at some board meetings, um, folks have a lot to say um, with regards to um, wanting, you know, responsiveness, wanting to understand, you know, be part of the pra practices. Um, so that's something that's really been um, an area of focus. So next slide. So how this kind of came to be, um, we really focused, um, we worked with a partner, Do East Partners, um, who is an organization that has worked within Baltimore County government, as well as other um, areas within the state of Maryland, um, and actually um, nationally as well, around um, strategic planning. And one of the things that we as a team said right away was it needed to be beyond just our department. There have often been over, um, you know, over the last probably decades, several different um, audits done of special education services or needs assessments done or kind of different different things, identifying a lot of our areas and of need. Um, also, those same um, conversations were a lot of time was internal. So it was within the department, us identifying for ourselves what those problems were or what needed to occur. Um, so with that, we really looked at a broad um, group of folks, really focused on engaging families, um, wanting principals as part of the conversation, the various offices, um, our CCAC, our Special Ed Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, and you can see here the list of um, that strategic planning committee. Um, the the way our process worked is we had the strategic planning committee that we you know took the work to, but we also then engaged and took the work from the strategic planning committee to our um, core leadership team within the Department of Special Education to really continue to have that that buy in from all aspects. Um, then the work we also just engaged with constituents, um, and you can see that touch point of um, almost 300 folks that we were able to either interview, staff surveys, community surveys. Um, we had our full department planning meetings in this and then listening and feedback sessions. Um, one of the things that I really liked about this process was that if, along the way, you know, it's, it continues to be a work in, it continues to be a work in progress, but we were able to take feedback. We'd had the draft plan and then we took that plan back um, to the groups for field testing and said, what do you think? How is this looking? 
um, and then made adjustments from there. So that listen, those listening and feedback sessions, often I feel like you see with strategic plans or with work is that it's done, we take and get feedback, but then there aren't changes made. And that was something that we really took to heart was that wanting to make sure it really met the needs of our um, constituent groups. Um, so then you can see in here, I will say before we kind of get into the rest is that we had really positive feedback from folks about this plan. Um, so working with our TABCO groups, um, actually after presenting at CCAC, which was a fantastic session um, with families, um, really around wanting to engage them differently and, and talking around our vision. Um, it was just an opportunity the Baltimore County Commission on Disabilities was present that night and then asked me to come present to them the next week. So we're getting really kind of, you know, good um, feedback around um, how um, this is providing vision and, and a feeling of, of movement and, and folks wanted to come together around that, which I think is really exciting for our kids and families. So next slide. So here you can see um, our vision and mission have been um, you know, revamped. Um, we look at our belief statements. So our vision being that all students receiving special education services are embraced by their school communities and achieve their goals in school and life. Um, mission, working collaboratively to foster the unique strengths of every student receiving special education services. And I will say that vision and mission has been revised and revised throughout this process. And we really took families and, and their feedback in that. Um, there were several times that um, our CCAT group was like, that's not right. We got to do it again. And we wanted that to be part of, of the work because it needs to re really reflect kind of all stakeholders. And then our belief statements here, which I'm not going to read them all to you, but um, that really uh, the beliefs are what we're driving our work in um, with, you know, no matter kind of what we're doing as a department, as our conversations with other folks is saying this is based on our beliefs and how we're moving things forward. Um, it, you, you could go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I. I I'm sorry, Allison, I don't want to nope. cut you off. I, I thought you You're were at a pause. I just want to really take a moment and highlight here, right? Like this mission and vision, I don't want us to um, kind of blow past it too, too um, easily because really when you look at this vision and you look at this mission, it's really calling for a change in our culture around serving our students with um, mm -hmm. IEPs, right? The, this vision is really about ensuring that our students that receive these services are not othered, right? That they're not segregated, they're not other, they're not someone else's um, concern to serve, right? They are they are fully included and that we see them as general education students who receive a service, right? And that's really about this idea of making sure that we don't other our special education students. And the idea of around our mission is really, I want to call out this idea of building like strength space, right? Seeing our students who receive services as a strength space um, um, approach to building their capacity around academics or whatever, you know, if it's career readiness, whatever the case may be. So thank you, Allison, for letting mm -hmm. me kind of just chime in because I think these really are, people can easily blow past these mission, vision, and, and values um, statements because we see them so often in places, but I really wanted to get the, the heart of what um, this work is yielding for us, this idea of making sure that we're not othering them and that we are seeing them as a strength space um, mm -hmm. perspective. So thanks Thank for you. letting me add. <laughs> no, no, thanks. And I think, you know, the one thing we heard over and over was that wanting to embrace by the school community yeah. is so often, um, you know, we within the infrastructure, especially in our elementary schools of regional programs and things and the way our models are, is that there's you know, quite often an opportunity for the students not making progress here. We want them to go somewhere else um, and and really focusing on that idea of families feeling embraced, children feeling embraced by their their homeschool community. Blueprint really speaks to that um, is those services within homeschool and how important that is. Um, and then going, you know, with the mission, really working collaboratively and the strength space, as you're saying, Dr. McComas. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, honestly, I've, I've talked about this a lot lately. I kind of blow through things, so <laughs> I apologize for that. No um, worries. So, yeah, so I'll go to the next slide. OK, so the other thing that's exciting about um, the strategic plan and the work the, um, that's based on results based accountability and the idea that 10 years down the road, you look at those um, 
high level population level results of how we know this is working. So 10 years from now, what are those things that we believe should be in place and that we know that this plan is working? So I am going to read these because I think they're really important. Um, we'll start with just the bottom left that special education services are fully funded to enable all students receiving services to be in their their least restrictive environment. That being important that we said their least restrictive environment. So that was a conversation that came up quite a, a lot was that it's not the least restrictive meaning that that would be everyone's included. We realize there's a continuum of services for students, um, but that students should be able to access those services in their least restrictive environment. Um, the second one being all educators and leaders receive rigorous, comprehensive training and professional development to effectively support students. So um, again, that need for just for training and professional development um, and that we know that our educators and leaders feel that feel equipped to be able to provide services for our students receiving special ed services. These also are all aligned to Blueprint as well. So just this, uh, wanted to highlight that. Um, all yeah. children, go ahead. Sorry. No. I just wanted to add, I think part of this, and I keep coming back to the culture change that we're trying to mm -hmm. um, implant and grow is again, this idea, you know, the shared results, this idea that our success of our students receiving IEP services is not, that does not just rest on the shoulders of our special educators, but that rests on every shoulder, right? Every one of us, every general classroom teacher, every administrator, every member of the community has a responsibility to students receiving these services. And so I think that I just want to, again, highlight this idea of the, of the fundamental culture shift that we need to make in our community and our organization around um, ensuring that our students with these services are successful. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the third one being there that um, again, we, you see that back to the feeling accepted, embraced and supported by school and community. Again, that idea that they're all these are our all of our students. I mean, kind of like and, and that is a shift in culture and climate for our system, honestly. Um, the family, the fourth being that students and their families have a range of accessible and comprehensive supports and resources for growth and achievement. Accessible is a key piece here. We receive feedback that, you know, we wanted, it's not just that those are out there, but that they're accessible for everyone um, and that our supports are equitable and that um, our, our families and students are able to receive them. Um, and then, and then this last one is that all students receiving special education services meet or exceed educational outcomes to become college career and community ready. So we know for what that looks like for all of our students, you know, there's a continuum of needs in special education and our students have a variety of, um, you know, uh, abilities and needs and, and, and various things that there are. We heard that from our families, but it's also community. So that's important. So 10 years, this is where we, we hope to look. So. The, the way this is broken down, which is, um, is our strategic roadmap. So we look at three-year priorities and strategies, and they're bucketed here. We identified pretty quickly as we were, um, you know, kind of throwing out where, where's our focus was that we heard there were three areas, our people, our services, and our culture. So under this um, are those being our priorities, which are bolded there. Um, but then is identifying then those strategies that we as a strategic planning committee and, and as a um, team have felt that are the strategies needed to be able to get to the improvement measures that we'll talk about next. So I'm clearly not going to read all of these to everyone and go through there, um, but you can see where we're really focusing on supporting the people and teams to do their best work for students, families, and partners, really putting emphasis on our people. This was an area that our, our SWAG group, which is our special ed um, advisory group for um, TABCO, um, really kind of leaned in was the idea of, you know, the appreciated the conversation around professional learning, um, around looking at that workload standard, um, which is our special education staffing plan, looking at um, aligning staffing structure to meet the needs of students and families. So they really felt like that was an area that um, we, we wanted to be able to kind of lean in around um, tactics to get to these strategies. The, our services being second is really just wanted to revamp and reimagine how we're doing this. An overhaul of special education in our system really is that reimagining how we're delivering services for students and families. So our services aspect here um, goes through just various, um, again, strategies that we know um, and our goal would be if we're doing these and we're getting there, we're going to see growth um, in all the areas that we need to see. Um, and then our culture, which I know we've talked about a lot and um, I appreciate Dr. McComas continuing to highlight is that there is a need for a culture shift um, and that's something that we need to continue to focus on um, to access um, to improve outcomes for our kids. So collectively creating and embedding a culture of trust, inclusion, belonging and service. And that is something that comes even with 
you know, within how our department interacts with other departments, how our department interacts with schools. Um, a focus for us this year was really on relationships, communication and collaboration um, as a starting point, and, and that's also embedded through here. So um, again, I'm not going to read these, but, but um, I know you have the opportunity to see them already. Next slide. So the performance measures are an aspect of this plan that I would say is different than we've seen in others, and, I, and I'm proud of this, is that we're really putting it out there. How are we measuring what we're saying is working? I often hear that question from you all, which I appreciate is, how do you know this is working? How do you know that, you know, what's your third party bill? Like, what does that actually do? Are you sure it's so what you think it should, right? That's important. And, and our goal with this, with our performance measures, is to be able to say, what are those measures for us to be able to say, we need to see some gains in these areas. We've committed to quarterly, um, both the summer and then each quarter have breaking down how these data points look to be able to provide um, you know measured progress um, so these really are 24 three year three year range performance measures but some of these are things that we want to be able to see improvement on in a hundred percent kind of like right away um, and, and again, you can see these in different ways. Some of the goals to kind of getting there, we talk about um, surveying of staff or something we really need staff and families. Um, when you see even our engagement numbers that I talked about in the front end around engaging with families and getting feedback, we had we had limited family feedback and engagement. Um, even though we did have it, it wasn't where we would like it. And that speaks to the fact that, you know, we're missing the mark with how our families are feeling connected to us and our services and how we can do that. So that's, you know, a focus area there. Um, really wanting to be able to um, support and just to kind of highlight a, a couple of areas here. Um, we want to increase the special education teacher retention. We really want to focus on our budget requests for um, position increase um, aligned with our student growth. Um, we have 1,400 more students receiving special education services this year than we did last year, um, but our positions didn't increase. So that's something we really want to highlight as far as how we're um, putting forth our budget requests. Um, again, focusing on that decrease in the disproportionate placement um, of Black and African American students. So we're working this summer on improved placement procedures to interrupt those how that how that is currently going on. Um, You'd see here we're looking for an increase in participation in extracurricular school based activities. That's important for families. You know, we've had conversations that families said, My kiddo doesn't go to prom. Why is that? What are those things that we need to do? Because those are meaningful to families. You'll see in there that 100% of eligible three and four year old students have access to services in their home school. That is 100% blueprint aligned and something we're highly committed to um, moving forward. And then the culture, again, I'm not going to read all of them, but you can just see there as far as um, we are really focused around increasing our communication to families. So um, we're committed to a monthly system wide communication to parents. Um, we are committed to um, having a quarterly information sessions for families to be able to have access to resources um, for us to really be able to, to lean in with them and make sure that our families are equitably accessing the resources that we have as a system and they shouldn't it shouldn't be. Um, it's not a secret what we offer. It's it's a mandate, right? So, but often families don't know their kind of rights around things or their understanding is what we hear. So we need to be able to lean into that. And that's what we're holding ourselves accountable for. Is there anything else you want me to hit on this, Dr. McComas, as far as performance measures? No, I think, you know, I, the one thing I ask that you take away from this performance measure slide is understanding that we are truly committed to measurable outcomes and holding ourselves accountable uh, to making progress on this uh, on this work. Um, and that, you know, we're this is more than just words, right? This is like mm -hmm. very serious data monitoring, impact monitoring. Um, and that's that's I think one of the main things that I ask that you take away from this point is that uh, in order for us to do the work that we need to do for our young people who receive services. We must um, we must be more rigorous in our internal accountability and our mutual accountability across the entire community. So, thank you. Thank you. Question on the slide, please. And then I think is there one more slide? I think there's two. Maybe okay. I don't know. I don't remember. But go ahead. Yeah, just to that. Um, could you go advance one more slide? There, there's one. Uh, again, focusing in on our impact, right? And then um, could you also go to the next one? 
just I wanted to give you all a sense that these beyond just the initial slide where we have performance measures, um, Alice and I are working and Kanya and I are working to really create this month by month um, playbook, if you will, right? And what are those measures that we're checking either monthly, quarterly, depending upon what the measure is, of course, the, the time to check on that um, vital sign uh, may be variable depending upon what it is, but just this very intense data monitoring process uh, to hold ourselves accountable. And, and ultimately, we believe we will be back uh, with all of you mm -hmm. providing updates on the progress that we're making. So I just wanted to kind of tie all of that together and I'll hand it right back to you, Allison, for no, questions. Yeah, um, you had a question, go ahead. Yeah, so back on that performance uh, measure slide, I uh -huh. love that there was that bullet point on, you know, seeing that 50% increase in students, uh, students with IEPs or receiving services um, engaged in extracurricular activities. Yes. Have you looked at the data for like the number of students receiving services that are in like advanced placement courses or taking those college credit, um, those college courses or enrolled in CTE or engaged in mm -hmm. any type of work based learning experience? And do you anticipate having any measures tied to that to increase their participation in uh, those types of programs as well? Absolutely. We're very committed to that transition, the, the work of transition, which is what you're really talking about for us, right? So um, I am I'm looking through my I don't interestingly, we don't have a measure related to transition, but it is definitely a strategy that you see in there. So that is something that 100 percent we are committed to. I'm um, really expanding now. I will say just for this year, we have um, two uh, kind of focus on two um, schools that are really focused on their 18 to 21 group for our kiddos that need access to, they're with us for six years in high school for some of those friends. And what does that look different? How does that look differently at the 18 to 21 range and kind of revamping that? Um, and then we'll be expanding that out past the two schools. So that was kind of an early win for us. Um, and then we are collaborating. So when you see those like inner office collaborations and all of that is really that conversation across our um, division around how what are the data points for how our kids are accessing and then we need to increase them do I could I tell you the data point today we could pull it I'm going to say it's not good enough right like we know that our kids aren't accessing enough and we need to be able to make sure that we're unlocking or kind of taking down those barriers for them to be able to access things differently um, so it's kind of my roundabout way of saying, no, no, I don't actually have the data today, but it's it's really definitely something that we're committed to and, and one of the areas. Um, and I think with this is like, you know, we've heard a lot of, oh, great strategies, now what, right? Like, what's your plan? And and that's really where what Dr. McComas is saying, the next step really is that implementation planning. We're continuing to work with our Dewey's partner um, around that implementation planning because this is critical work. So breaking down for each of those strategies, what are our tactics to get there? As a department, um, we'll be assigning out those those strategies to our various department members and then you know and then going from there on what are those tangible tactics to get there as well as that are impacting the measures so um i appreciate the question can I'll i say the next that I, oh, no go ahead i just yeah. want to say i i, I want to um, build upon that uh, because it really i i keep coming back to this culture of ensuring that our students that receive services are not othered right I, and i'll i'll just uh, recount and this is honestly Six years ago, I had a conversation, seven years maybe, I got a conversation with somebody who indicate like, well, we don't have, you know, students with IEPs because we don't have a special educator. And I said, no, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> the The services follow the students, right? We don't we don't hold students back because the services aren't there. The services flow where the students flow, right? Um, and so I think that to me in that conversation I had um, a, a number of years ago really uh, rung in my heart around the deep seated work that we need to do around understanding access and opportunity, right, um, for students receiving services. So just I wanted to piggyback because it really gets back to um, culture sometimes people think is a soft word, but it's really it's it's fundamental to change our outcomes for our students. So yeah. And that's where we have so much work to do. I mean, it still is that conversation around, you know, we were in conversations today around strategies, like high leverage strategies for improving um, instruction for students. And we're saying, no, we don't 
it's not a different strategy. It's good instructional strategies, right? And our students receiving service, special education services are going to also benefit from that. So it's just even kind of shifting that conversation with um, with principals, with everyone around, like we need good instruction. We need good first instruction for kids. We need this um, and how then, yes, there are things we do with regards to specially designed instruction for our students receiving special education services. But ultimately we need those same, um, some same strategies across for all students um, and I, I will say a lot is that you know the increase in collaboration this year across our departments within our division I think is it has already reaping benefits around us all speaking the same language um, you know Mache's department as well as our you know working together to ensure that and that's again one of our strategies but to ensure that you know even even our department of um, academics all of Megan's team is saying the same thing as ours is. We're in in you know forums together, and I you know just excited for kind of where the direction we're heading. So we'll go to the next slide um, just quickly, and these are kind of the things that we've identified as our um, our early wins. So, or maybe not. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, it's the there it it's is. This. Oh, there. OK, so um, just early wins. These are things and I've talked through a lot of this, but just as like just to highlight those things that we already know that we're we're working on in order to make a shift. So um, redefining kind of how we're doing professional learning for this coming year. Um, I mentioned the collaborating with the content offices that family support. We're actually realigning resources to have a family support position. Um, uh, kind of revamping how we're doing that family support position to really be able to lean in around family training um, and support the monthly newsletters. Um, again, I'm not going to go through this, and, but I just wanted to highlight, you know, yes, there's strategies and there's a lot of tactics to get there. We're already moving um, on some of these things and that we'll continue to do so as as we go. So um, with that, I really, truly appreciate. Clearly, I said if I get excited, I can keep talking and talking. I, I appreciate um, the opportunity to talk with you about this and to have this forum. Um, it's it's good work um, that I'm really proud of our team and our and our system to kind of take this this effort um, for our students. And I think that we're in a good space as far as moving forward and having um, improving those outcomes. So thanks. Well, thank you, Miss Myers. Do we have <laughs> um, questions from board members? Um, I, I don't have a question. I just want to say how much I appreciate the process that you used to create this. Um, when you had that one of those first slides that talked about the number of people that you engaged with, especially the community, um, I think that is just a win just to get the process going in the right direction. Um, and when you spoke about coming back, you know, not just taking the feedback, but taking the feedback, making changes, coming back again, I think that process um, is really um, a very strong process that has resulted in a really comprehensive um, strategic plan. So I just wanted to, you know, thank you for the work that um, you've led. Your passion is just oozing out as you, um, you know, we've heard you speak before about contracts and things, but hearing you yeah. speak about this strategic, <laughs> this, you know, strategic plan, your, you know, your passion is um, coming out. So, you know, thank you um, for everything that you did to put this together. And again, this is something that I would like to see come back um, to our committee as far when I mean, you've built in the performance measures and the, the monitoring, um, but I but it is so comprehensive and such a need for our system that I think it's appropriate for our committee to kind of um, take this journey with you and, and get some of those updates as they happen or how we can support you um, as a board, especially as we make, you know, budget and monetary decisions. So please bring us into that. You know, we're not just supposed to say yes to everything, but how can we support you know, the work that you're doing. Absolutely. Thank yeah, thank you. Oh, absolutely. And I and we can discuss if we think we want to bring it back here to the committee quarterly or at, at the semester. And and uh, so we can discuss that. And we're excited to have your engagement and support around policy and budget, right? Because they're, right. they're the, your two big mm -hmm. levers uh, and we need your support every step of the way. So we appreciate it. And, and, and your ambassadorship with the community, right? right? And what's nice is Ms. Pumphrey is on the policy or the chair of the policy review. Ms. Booker Dwyer is on the budget committee. So, you know, we're, our ears are on other committees that, <laughs> that, you know, that can support this. Because if we can lift our students who are receiving special services, it's it's going to make such a difference for our overall, you know, our overall achievement. So it's it's huge. So thank you again. Absolutely. So. Do you want, we need a motion to approve the plan? 
or I still have, I, I would, I oh, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Oh, I, didn't, I didn't see. Go ahead. That's okay. I, I know my uh, camera's off. Um, yeah, I just wanted to echo um, a lot of what Ms. Lichter said. Her comments were, um, uh, thank you for giving this presentation. Uh, I do get, this is one um, email I get uh, mm -hmm. pretty regularly about um, IEP services and some frustrations that students and parents are having. Um, I, but I also hear many good things too. So um, I, I, I want to, I like that we're trying, we're working on this and to get a consistent across all of our schools when it comes to the IEP program so that we are giving our kids what they need in every school. Um, and I, I, I would like to hear more communications about this as well um, as far as how we are, you know, implementing this with Fidelity and consistently across the board because um, I think that's where kind of the, the breakdown starts to happen and some of our kids don't get the services that they yeah. they need and should be receiving. So again, thank you for all this work and what you're doing. And I, I would third, second, whatever, um, hearing more about this um, throughout the year. Great, thank you. Thank you. So we do we do need a motion to approve this or? Well, no, we were actually, because this is our, our operational plan. So, right. um, you know, but uh, it's no, that's our, fine. our goal. Okay, I was going to say, we'll continue. We don't need to it. We don't need it. You on this. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I don't, we don't need to go through the motions if we don't yeah. need to. Um, again, thank you, um, Ms. Myers and Ms. Bally. Also, I know you are a big part of this. So thank you for your work. I talk too much. I don't give her time to talk. Sorry, Connie. You, no, you usually <laughs> don't do talk. You usually don't talk too much, Miss Myers. So I the know. fact that you did talk a lot with I knew the passion was there. So yeah, right. no, no <laughs> sorries needed. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share this comprehensive yeah. plan with you guys today. We appreciate it. Thanks. OK, let me see where we are. OK, so we are now going to get an update and on the new elementary ELA curriculum, specifically the professional learning plan. And we have Ms. Shea and Dr. Kraft to um, provide an overview and answer any questions. Hi, good afternoon. So um, that's a tough act to follow from special ed, but we will ooze um, our passion just as much if we can. Um, so we are here to give you an update on professional development. Um, of course, HMH, thanks to the support of this committee and the full board is underway. Um, and so we shared the details of our professional learning plan in the hopes of illustrating that it's multifaceted, um, job alike, and really just constant. But we also wanted to give you specifics about what that training would entail. Um, so we can certainly go through a same offer or we can just open it for questions. I did want to share um, some exciting news just because today was actually our first day of training. And on day one of um, summer, we had 549 teachers trained today. Um, so that is really exciting. Um, and it was the first day offered. And I think we had the sessions offered in the registration system and they were full within like the hour. So I think it's a really good sign of our team teachers commitment and excitement uh, that they're spending their summertime learning, um, but it's also an exciting uh, reflection for us. So we're waiting. We've gotten just a few um, happy emails, so that's also a good sign um, of people telling us that the presenters were fantastic and they really enjoyed it and they're excited. So um, I'm sure more we did offer a formal survey, so certainly as we continue to come back, we'll share that uh, and be monitoring closely the feedback we get from teachers. But um, that's my informal data for today, just because it's super hot off the presses and exciting. Um, so I want to, um, the other thing that I wanted to add before I open it to question, just because it came up yesterday, and as you mentioned, um, Ms. Lichter, about the crossover with committees. I know Ms. Dominowski and Ms. Booker Dwyer were there yesterday. We were talking in the budget committee um, about really advocating for the budget needs that go with um, total ownership of a rollout such as this. So we we hit you with the purchase order of 10 million, but that's really for the materials and for the vendor partner. Um, the other cost associated with any rollout is professional development. And so um, wanted to share a little bit of an update that um, just in terms of um, I mentioned that we had our first day of training. So our first pass this summer, we are offering enough sessions that every teacher had an opportunity to do that first session, the getting started with into reading that you saw in the presentation. 
So just to give a ballpark, a price tag for us to give every teacher just that one day is around four hundred thousand dollars. And so we'd like to give teachers more than one day in the summer to get ahead of that planning. Um, at this point, we've committed to at, at least that one day, um, but to do um, two days um, and even uh, potentially a little bit more for them to plan um, would be closer to a million dollars. So I just wanted to offer that for context. Um, we did secure the funding thanks to Dr. McComas's leadership and her partnership with Dr. Yarborough and Mr. Hartlove um, for that one day of summer, definitely. And then as you saw reflected, we do have then a plan to follow up with those built in days in the calendar so that there will also be distributed opportunities for professional learning um, within the school year. So I just wanted to offer that since it did come up yesterday um, as a question. Um, and um, then I open it for any questions you have for us about the information we've already shared or if you wanted us to kind of go back through. So first I want to apologize, Ms. Demonowski. When I mentioned who was on committees, I forgot to mention you or <laughs> chair okay. of the budget. I'm so visual that I'm looking at people, so I apologize for that. So um, are there questions or would you like them to go um, through it more? I have questions, but if anybody wants to go through it more, then we can go. No, why don't we more. start with the questions? So go ahead, Ms. Demonowski. Um, So I was looking at how um, the edible grade level lessons, and I'm assuming these are would be online somehow or you know done yes. in your computer. Uh, I've been trying to figure out a way uh, that we could or how to go about incorporating using Schoology more so our, our parents at home can um, follow along with the lesson plans and help out with their children, whether it be homework or, if, you know, um, or if they miss school for some reason. Can Is there a way that, that we could integrate these um, lesson plans with Schoology too? So I'm going to answer that in two parts, Ms. Dobinowski. So okay. um, yes, it, and so the first thing I'm going to say is that parents do have their own portal um, within the HMH platform. It's not currently live because it's technically still June and we haven't actually paid for anything yet. Um, but once we roster all of our students over the summer, so with the start of the school year, families will have access to a portal that will give them a view, which does allow them to, the second part of your question in terms of following along with their student, being able to understand the modules, the themes, the different um, home practice that students can access through Amira, parents will be able to see a lot of those resources. The second question that you asked about lesson plans is a little more complicated because it actually then um, intersects with our collaboration with our teachers union and in terms of what teachers are required to post. So we can make unit materials, unit overviews, um, all of those materials available for parents. The lesson planning, the lesson plan piece becomes a little bit trickier. So we would have to work collaboratively um, with the teachers union because as of right now, that's not a mandated expectation by contract that teachers would have to do that. So it would be by design and somewhat inconsistent for parents. So I would hate to say to parents, hey, this is going to be available universally because that's outside the scope of what I could require. Does that answer your question a little bit? So there's plenty of ways that we can use Schoology to help parents engage in the curriculum and to help their child and to know all of that information specifically about lesson plans is a little bit of a different story. Yeah, it does, and it, it kind of helps me answer the other questions um, about, you know, the parents having their own portal to find. I, I just, with Schoology and parents having to have to use that for so long, there is more familiarity and, you know, trying to remember, you know, your codes and passwords Different and portals. logins yep. for everything to be yep. able to go to Schoology and find that would be ideal, obviously, yep. but... Um, how that we absolutely can. That we can absolutely um, address to make it easier so that um, to your point, it's that one stop shopping and they have lots of different ways to engage um, because we have integrated the HMH platform. Same thing for our students. Students will not have to go somewhere else. They will actually access that content by going in through Schoology. So we are utilizing um, that integration to help streamline that process and that will be a part of we are working closely. I know we mentioned last time with our communications office about a system wide communication plan for all stakeholders. Uh, we're going to have 
things on the um, splash page on the header so that um, our parent and community um, family and community engagement office is going to have. I think it's monthly where we're going to be dropping videos highlighting different aspects of the curriculum for parents and families. Um, so we will have lots of opportunities for parents um, and to do it in forums either on the website or through Schoology that they're already familiar with to try to streamline and strengthen that partnership. Thank you. That's great. Sure. Yeah. Other questions, Ms. Pumphrey or Ms. Booker Dwyer? I have, I have some questions. Go ahead. But not a lot. So I, <laughs> you know, I always think uh, the big picture, and I and I always start with like the assessment data. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and I'm I'm going to get to where I'm going. But with with the assessment data, have you looked at the assessments to see what concepts students have, are struggling with? And then in the professional development that you're providing through this reading, uh, through this new curriculum, is there kind of a, a specific focus on that content that students have shown to historically struggle with on um, on assessments to kind of go deeper, maybe in some of those components of the curriculum? So it's, it's a great question and I'm going to um, start and then I'm going to invite Dr. Kraft. So the first question about do we analyze the assessments and identify patterns? Absolutely, yes. The main pattern that has come up for us, especially in elementary school, um, is around standard one, which is about using text evidence to support their answer. That is by far our biggest area, really K through 12. Yeah, um, claims, they, evidence, uh, and reasoning, right? Uh, claims, uh, across evidence, content. And reasoning. <laughs> um, so there's no question that that is the biggest part of it. That is also a focus of the professional learning that we started with reading specialists um, in terms of the opportunities the curriculum has in which students do that in um, within their um, for lack of a better term, workbook, um, their reader, where they're actually asked to, we used to really go through um, sticky notes, trying to help students learn to do that. And one of the benefits that is incorporated explicitly in the training is that those opportunities of citing text evidence now occur right within the materials of the program because students have an interactive opportunity to annotate text and use text evidence because they can actually write in a consumable. So it's an explicit part of the training because it's a new feature within the curriculum that we have access to, but it aligns perfectly with an area that has long um, challenged us. The other thing that I want to point out is the first training really is about teaching our teachers the program. What what's in this curriculum? How is it organized? How do I navigate this to understand, you know, exactly just um, the lay of the land and, and understand how to best realize that practice? And that's really important so that um, and which is why it's ideal to do in the summer, because as soon as those students step in the room, I want them teaching the children using the curriculum, not their nose in the book, trying to even figure out, you know, so we really are intentional about trying to um, front load. This is how it works. This is everything that's in there. This is how it all comes together for planning. What we've done strategically, and, and Dr. Kraft, I'll invite you to talk even more about this, is there are going to be specific moments during the year where then we talk about integrating data literacy. So after students have completed two module assessments and MAP, we're going to have a specific professional learning that's about how do you use that data to be responsive to what's happening in the curriculum. And we actually have a plan to do that with MAP data with administrators um, because that's a new integration that HMH has with NWES that we're really excited about. Um, so we try to create and work in partnership with HMH to plan professional learning just in time with where we want teachers focusing, right? So in the summer, it's about get to know it. In August, it's planning for effective instruction. And then when we come in um, November, it'll be let's look at those first unit assessments and really figure out how to plan responsibly. So we have that as a part of our ongoing um, plan. So Dr. Kraft, you want to add anything? <laughs> So you said it so beautifully, Ms. Shea. Um, so everything that Ms. Shea said, uh, and I would say that we were very strategic. So it's a both and. So yes, we have been looking at historical trend data. And uh, like Ms. Shea said, not only in elementary, but across K-12, our standard one is one that we saw that pattern and we leaned in heavy last year um, doing um, interdisciplinary uh, professional development because standard one lives everywhere, not just in ELA. 
Um, and so we do look at that and we're going to have so much just in time data that we also will be able to use historical trend data, which is how we set up our professional development plan. And what are we seeing right now in the moment so that we can make micro decisions as we go along? So we've made a macro professional development plan looking at historical data, looking at where um, you know, like uh, Ms. Shea said, where assessments fall, um, what are the needs that we see, um, both of students and teachers, and we made that plan. And we're gonna collect data along the way because we're also gonna say there might be things that come up that we had not considered. Um, and so we have left enough flexibility so that we can respond to other needs as they come up. And so we've really kind of looked at both. Um, in addition, I would also say, in addition to doing those macro professional development, and a lot of times we use professional development to be synonymous with training. Um, and macro is very important. Trainings are important. Sometimes you just have to learn what it is. We've really placed a very heavy emphasis on job embedded coaching, um, where there's opportunities within professional learning communities for them to see model lessons, um, uh, where we have a teacher leader core coming together so that there's teacher leaders within the building. Um, I know Ms. Shea has some um, pretty exciting numbers around how many days we actually have yeah. from the company. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna let her um, add in right now. This goes back to the budget committee question about sort of the total cost. So and what we talked about was sometimes um, in a purchase order, it's deceiving because it'll say zero dollars for professional learning because that's a part of the negotiation when they do the price. Um, so what I wanted to frame it is we um, for year one, we get a total of 259 days and I'm using air quotes because you might add up and realize that's more than a school year, but because those are capped in terms of participants, if we have to have like five sessions to accommodate enough of our teachers, that can count as five days, even if they're held on one date. So um, what we do is then strategically spread those out um, in terms of we reserve some of those days to be job embedded coaching. So we have plans to do actual learning walks with administrators, with experts from the company to help us in training our leaders on how to give feedback related to the implementation of the program. We also have plans to do um, Allison, Ms. Myers referenced our partnership with special education. We've reserved a pod of days specifically to do that in collaboration with special education, looking at specific groups so that the focus of those learning walks and professional days um, is on that population. Same with ESOL. So what we do strategically is take that 259, think about how we want to do those engagements for both professional learning with teachers around unit planning, um, while also providing support for reading specialists, um, our staff development teachers, and then of course our administrators, um, where we tweak that focus to be more about providing feedback around implementation. The other piece that we did was we saved some days, so we have 66 days set aside for year two, um, and that's intentional because a lot of times you put all in in the beginning and then uh, we're left holding the bag right? when, when we're trying to, to sustain it, um, and that's also important because we hire a lot of new teachers every year. We have changes in leadership and changes in teachers, so we wanted to make sure that we had a plan for sustainability. Um, so we have reserved some of the days um, for year two. Also, because as um, Dr. Kraft said, um, we know that HMH interreading is highly rated on ed reports. We know that there are districts across the country and across the state of Maryland that have gotten really good results. We need to be able to be responsive to what is and isn't working for us. And so part of why we want to make sure we maintain some of that time is if we're starting to see a particular grade level or um, we see a particular um, area within the component within the curriculum. So maybe it's more about writing or maybe it's focused more on those um, high levels of complex text for comprehension. We have that ability to, to flex that. Um, I think the other piece that's really exciting when thinking about professional learning is um, having that opportunity to know what you don't know, right? So in the beginning, before you've really had an opportunity, you need to kind of go through the curriculum all the way and understand the intentional design. And so part of the commitment we've made with our teachers and with our building leaders that we're going to continue to emphasize 
is we're going to go through it all the way this first year. We know that there's going to be a lot of opportunities for us to um, integrate even more with our science and social studies content, to have opportunities to integrate novels that we know are going to great give our students great experiences with a different type of text. But what we're committed to is we want to be strategic and intentional around those um, adaptions we make. So the first year is really about understanding the coherence of that scope and sequence, because that's so much of what the science of reading um, body of research really talks about is having that coherent approach. Um, and we don't want we're used to um, putting you know, piecemealing things together, and we're really committed this time to say, let's spend a year, get through all of the units, think about how those play out in terms of the different types of assessments, which one yields different information that's more actionable, how is the transferring for different populations of students, um, and then make those opportunities for some of the professional learning to then be about how do we then differentiate our response based on what we see in this first year. Um, and that's, uh, really important part of professional learning because as Dr. Krauss said, sometimes um, you'll ask teachers, you know, what questions do you have? And they don't know yet because they have to try it. They have to actually be in the classroom with their students and then come back and say, um, this is what I need help with. When we adopted Houghton Mifflin when I was in the classroom, I didn't even find one of my favorite resources until the second year of implementation. I was unpacking my boxes for the summer after the summer and I was like, what's this? And it wound up being a phenomenal resource that was in the curriculum that I didn't even know about near one. So I just offer that as um, I was a good teacher, but I still had um, room to grow. So what other questions can we answer? No for you? Question. That was all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bogodoro, usually you tell me up front the number of questions you're going to ask me and then I can kind of <laughs> take them off. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, based on what Go ahead. Um, Megan, when you or when you said 259 days from uh -huh. the um, publisher, is that for year one only? Yes. OK. Yes. And then and, we reserved. Right. Go ahead. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, we do have days for year two, which uh, Ms. Shea will tell you in a minute. But, but also we have rollover minutes or rollover days. So okay. if for some reason we don't need them all or we figure out a strategic plan, we have gotten um, a way to uh, roll them over. But Mache, how many have we saved for year two? We already have 66 set aside for year two. Um, and then as um, Dr. Kraft was talking about, we also um, try to cluster so that we can maximize and, and roll over days as much as we can. So while I appreciate the companies, you know, helping with a PD, I'm a real huge advocate of growing our own. So I've I've lost track of how many resource teachers are left in your office for next year, right? So it's just something for board members to be aware of as we start the next um, budget cycle that three resource teachers for a hundred and seven or eight, I've lost track, right. elementary schools, right? 110 is not is not is just not workable so just something i mean we we the budget came it was overwhelming we you know cuts were made um, but as we move into the next year's budget session i just want to um us to keep that in mind as far as when year two comes we'll still have some support from the company but we have to grow our own people to be able to provide that coaching and that pd um to ensure the successful implementation so um, those are my two points. Christina, Ms. Pumphrey, did you have any questions? Well, um, Chair Lichter and Ms. Shea, you kind of stole my thunder for all my uh -oh. questions because you did a great job of <laughs> answering what I was already going to ask. So thank you. Most of my concern was regarding um, the supports to the administrators and leaders. And you sort of you answered all of those questions with um, speaking to the learning walks. I mean, also regarding that um, second year and also focusing um, for that second year, sort of hearing the teacher feedback to determine and kind of focus that second year on professional development based upon the feedback of, you know, regarding what's working and what's not working. So thank okay. you for that. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I referenced before about year one, we're doing it straight, everyone, right? We're going to give it a chance because I already have some school because teachers are amazing. They're already like, can I add this? Can I change this? I don't want to lose this. You know, that's how teachers brains work. And I'm trying to say, let's let's learn it. But one of the things we've built in is at the end of every unit, we have specific focus groups opportunities so that right when it's fresh in your mind, tell me about unit one. Tell me about what you saw and what you need so that then the team can use that to make some of those strategic recommendations rounding the bend into year two. So we're going to 
have lots of opportunities um, for teachers. We have things like survey links, but we're also going to have in person opportunities for focus groups for teachers to actually come and talk um, together for us. Um, and this year we are bringing making a comeback. So to Chair Lichter's point, we are much smaller than we've ever been for any other rollout, and it's something that uh, keeps Dr. Kraft and I up at night um, because we also uh, have a sense of urgency that we need to get this right. Our students need it, and we have a sense of urgency around moving the outcome. So we have um, we're going to do more. We have a small but mighty, um, but we are bringing back a teacher leader core. And what that looks like is we ask. This is something that we had in place years ago as a system where we ask schools to help identify teacher leaders at grade levels. It helps us as a system to grow our own in terms of those future leaders and those rock stars, um, but also sometimes the ability to receive information and coaching from a peer is greater because teachers feel that that's someone that's in the trenches with them and, and planning with them every day. The challenge, so so we have those big plans and we're excited and it's a way for us to try to be ripples in a pond and strengthen that approach. Um, the challenge, um, and I'll, I'll, I'm sure many of you are, are already aware, um, having a teacher leader core means we need to pull teachers out of the building to train and sustain and with teacher shortages and sub coverages, that may not last that long, right? Because we'll have to be responsible. So I'm just putting out there that that's our design. We'll work creatively about virtual and recordings and try to leverage all the other tools that we've learned. But sometimes even those plans can wind up further hurting the schools that need that support the most because the schools that have that high turnover, if you're a school that has all of your first grade teachers are brand new, nobody is your teacher leader, right? Because you're you're trying to sustain that. So I just offer that in, we have hope and we're, we're trying to plan for that to build capacity, but we're also being realistic about the other current context to make sure that um, we're being mindful as we partner with schools to do that. Okay. Um, it's 3.30, so I'm mindful of the time, so um, we're, we're okay. Um, I think we're almost at the end. Are there any other questions about the PD plan? Okay, so thank you for that information. Again, another topic that we need to kind of bring back. Keep coming um, back. <laughs> coming back. It's going to come back. Okay, um, the last topic... Um, and the last topic will only take a couple minutes, really. Um, Former board member um, Mr. Kuhn had asked for information about the kindergarten readiness assessment. Um, he's no longer on that committee. So when um, Dr. McComas and I met to plan today, I didn't want to her to do a, present a presentation done for someone who's not here yet. So the question is, what information about um, the, KR, the kindergarten readiness assessment do current board members want to hear? And then we'll bring it back customized to what to what we want. So, um, and again, that's given at the start of the year. So it might also be prudent to just wait till um, those KRA is given in the beginning of the year um, to bring back the results and overview of what the KRA is and then how our kids in BCPS are doing. But I don't wanna speak for the whole group, so that's why I put it on the agenda. So thoughts from um, three other board members about that topic? No, Ms. Pumphrey, are you I, gonna say something? Yes, I was gonna say there's, a, I had a couple questions that again, um, I don't know if it's, um, I don't know if they are appropriate now or after, like you said, after the, the testing sort of. Um, my questions are regarding the data and how it's used mainly. Um, and um, are parents receiving the data? Um, what action is taking once we once we receive the data? That type of thing. Baselines that we're using. So, Ms. Perfect, you're making me think because of the time. Why don't board members send me questions um, concerning the KRA, and and I could share that with Dr. McComas, and then they can put together that presentation based on what we're looking to to see. Is that okay? Okay. Um, okay, so yes, that um, Dr. Works for me. thank you. Okay, Dr. McComb, does that work for you? Absolutely, and perhaps we can, um, if once we get those questions, we that may be something that we can do in our August meeting since it'll be right before the start of the school year when things get administered. Um, I'll also just add, since we've identified just a number of things that we'd like to bring back, um, and I'm sure you have other topics that you would like to learn more about what we do, how we do, um, you can send those topics to Chair Lichter or me, and um, I'll put together a proposed roadmap 
for next year's uh, meetings. And of course, it's always will be a living roadmap that we can make adjustments as things come up. But it's helpful, I have found, to uh, provide sort of like a, a plan, a scope and sequence, if you will, of how we'll use our committee time. Um, and so I just wanted to add that um, for, for the good of the cause. And one other thing I've been thinking about is, is we all do school visits. Um, so sometimes our visits can be through the lens of the curriculum committee. So something just to think about as, you know, some of this was brand new for us this year, but like with ELA, like what would you want us to be looking for? Or what questions would you want us to be asking um, principals or teachers just so that we can help bring back some information, but also to kind of train our eye on what mm -hmm. we're looking for um, and what, you know, as we're, we're in the school. So um, just a thought as we kind of move into next year. Yep, but I'd be uh, happy to give some resources for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I think doing the, you know, doing the pre-work um, allows us to have more conversation and drill into a lot of the topics more. So I do also want to thank your staff for putting together the narrated PowerPoints um, because I think it really helps the flow of the committee um, to be able to not just listen, but to be able to kind of dig deeper. So thank you for that. Um, I will stop talking. Um, is there, okay, is there any further business? I think we just did that. <laughs> we just did further business. Okay, um, since there's no, okay, the last item on the agenda is announcements. Our next curriculum committee meeting will be on August 3rd. Is anybody out of town that week besides for me? Miss Booker Dwyer, I see you making some. I don't know yet where that's okay. um, our AAU week for, for my daughter. So we'll find out this weekend if she makes it and then we'll be in Iowa for that week. OK, so I do know that I'm away. I can try to log in virtually or we can look at moving that week if it's a conflict um, for others. So. Um, OK, Ms. Dominowski or Ms. Pumphrey, is it a conflict for either one of you? No, that is yeah. not a conflict. OK, all right. OK, so if hearing no further business, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everybody, so much for um, all the work you did to prepare and for answering. We don't ask easy questions, so thank you um, for <laughs> for answering all of our questions. Thank you for the opportunity. So OK, all right. Have a great day. Thank, thank you, everybody. Enjoy your summer.